Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mindset Matters, the courage to continue. This podcast is meant to bring hope and inspiration to your day. You and I have been born into a unique time in history. The command to guard our heart and mind has never been more vital to our mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Let's guide each other on this journey. If you have a hero heart story from your corner of the world that you would like to share on this podcast, please send it to the email address, mindsetmatterspodcast, numeral one, at gmail.com. If you know of someone who would benefit from uplifting content, please share this podcast. Please visit our website, mindsetmatters.buzzsprout.com. Now please join me for an uplifting hero heart story. In the darkest hours of World War II, amidst the shadows of Nazi-occupied Holland, a remarkable woman emerged as a beacon of hope and resilience. Corrie ten Boom, a courageous Dutch watchmaker, defied the brutality of the Third Reich with a secret weapon they could never dismantle, her unbreakable spirit. Join me on a journey into the heart of one of history's unsung heroes as we unlock the secrets of Corrie ten Boom's incredible life and her unwavering commitment to the power of love, forgiveness, and the enduring human spirit. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Mindset Matters, the podcast where we explore the extraordinary lives of ordinary individuals who have overcome immense challenges and emerged as beacons of inspiration. I'm your host, Lisa Sinclair, and today we embark on a remarkable journey into the life of one such individual. This is episode one, The Courage to Forgive Amidst Extreme Cruelty, The Hero Heart of Corey Ten Boom. I'd like to paint a picture of the setting of our story, the geographical place, and the time in history. Our story takes place in Harlem, a city in the Netherlands that's not just rich in history, but also bursting with vibrant culture. Nestled on the northern fringes of Ronstadt, one of Europe's most densely populated regions, Harlem is a captivating gem in the crown of North Holland. This city is often referred to as Sparn City due to its scenic location along the river Sparn. It's just a stone's throw away from the bustling heart of Amsterdam, a mere 20 kilometers or 12 miles to the east. Harlem's proximity to the North Sea coast and its picturesque coastal dunes add to its allure, making it a favored destination for those seeking both urban excitement and natural beauty. But Harlem isn't just about its stunning landscapes and proximity to the Dutch capital. It has a fascinating claim to fame as the historical epicenter of the tulip bulb growing region, a heritage that has earned it the affectionate moniker Blaumenstead, or Flower City. For centuries, the vibrant fields of colorful tulips have adorned this city, creating a visual spectacle that's nothing short of breathtaking. This beautiful city and the people who lived there in the early 1900s had no idea what was about to unfold. World War II, often described as the most cataclysmic conflict in human history, was a harrowing chapter that unfolded on a global stage from 1939 to 1945. It was a time when the world stood on the precipice of annihilation as the forces of tyranny clashed with the defenders of freedom and democracy. At the heart of this tumultuous period lies a chilling and heartbreaking event known as the Holocaust, a grim testament to the darkest corners of human nature. World War II erupted from the smoldering ashes of World War I, fueled by the ambitions of dictators and the unresolved issues that had simmered for decades. Adolf Hitler's expansionist dreams, Imperial Japan's militarism, and the aggressive ambitions of fascist Italy 
plunge the world into a conflict that would embroil nations from every corner of the globe. It was a war of unprecedented scale, with battles raging across Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Pacific, and it would claim the lives of over 70 million people. The Holocaust saw the systemic extermination of six million Jews in concentration camps alongside the persecution and murder of millions of Romani people, disabled individuals, political dissidents, and other so-called, quote, undesirables, unquote. The horror of the Holocaust unfolded in gas chambers, labor camps, and mass shootings, leaving an indomitable legacy of suffering and sorrow. However, amid the darkness of that era, the spirit of resilience and heroism shone brightly. Ordinary people rose to the occasion, demonstrating extraordinary courage. This is the setting in which an ordinary family named the Ten Booms lived. In the tapestry of history, Corrie Ten Boom's life began in 1892, woven into the fabric of a deeply devout Dutch Christian family. This remarkable family's legacy was one of boundless generosity and unwavering social commitment, recognized and celebrated in their community for generations. Casper Ten Boom was the patriarch of the family and a central figure in their lives. He was a devout Christian and a watchmaker by trade. He was known for his gentle and kind nature, as well as his unwavering faith in God. He instilled strong moral values in his children and was the driving force behind the family's commitment to helping those in need. His warmth and wisdom made him a respected figure in their community. Corey, short for Cornelia Arnolda Johanna Ten Boom, was the youngest Ten Boom and was the central figure in the family story. She was a courageous and compassionate woman, known for her deep faith and commitment to helping others. Corey's strong sense of responsibility led her to manage the family's watchmaking business and play a pivotal role in the underground network. Betsy Ten Boom was Corey's dearest older sister. She worked alongside the family in the watchmaking business and played a pivotal role in their humanitarian efforts. Betsy was a deeply spiritual and kind-hearted woman. She was known for her unwavering faith in God and her ability to see the good in even the bleakest circumstances. Her love and compassion had a profound impact on those around her. Betsy was instrumental in caring for the refugees hidden in their home. Her spiritual strength and message of forgiveness continued to inspire Corey and others, even in the concentration camps. Willem Ten Boom was the oldest of the Ten Boom siblings. He was a pastor and, like the rest of the family, deeply committed to their Christian faith. Willem's dedication to helping others and his work with the Dutch underground contributed to the family's collective efforts during the war. His influence on his younger siblings, particularly Corey, was profound. Nolly was another of the Ten Boom siblings. She was married and had a family of her own during the war, but was still actively involved in the family's efforts to provide a safe haven for those persecuted by the Nazis. Nolly's courage and commitment mirrored that of her parents and siblings. Aunt Johns and Aunt Bep were two unmarried sisters of Casper, and they lived with the Ten Boom family. They were supportive of the family's actions and the sheltering of Jews and others during the war. Aunt Johns, in particular, was known for her strong character and her role in aiding those in need. The Ten Boom Home, a haven of warmth and compassion, stood as an open door to anyone in need. It was a place where the weary and the downtrodden found solace, where the hungry were fed, and where the cold-hearted grip of despair was met with the warm embrace of love. 
The Ten Boom residence was not just a house. It was a sanctuary of kindness and acceptance where the spirit of Christian charity thrived. Going back to the early 1800s, in the picturesque city of Harlem, nestled at the northern edge of the bustling Ronstadt region in Holland, a legacy of craftsmanship began to take root in 1837. It was here in the Bayet that Corrie ten Boom's grandfather, Willem, established a humble watchmaker's shop. The ten Boom shop, with its intricate timepieces and delicate gears, occupied the ground floor of the family's residence, where each tick and talk marked the passage of time in harmony with their lives above. This legacy of watchmaking was passed down through the generations, from Willem to his son Casper, until it ultimately fell into the capable hands of Corey herself. Corey's inheritance of the watchmaker's shop was not just a passing of a trade, but a groundbreaking moment in Dutch history. With determination and a pioneering spirit, she became the first Dutch female watchmaker, shattering gender barriers in a traditionally male-dominated craft. Cory ten Boom was a modest and unassuming woman in her physical appearance. She stood at an average height, had a somewhat frail build, and possessed a gentle and serene countenance that seemed to reflect the deep well of kindness within her. Her hair was typically seen in a simple, pulled-back style, and she often wore plain, conservative clothing, consistent with her Dutch upbringing. Corey's eyes were perhaps the most striking feature of her face. They were clear, expressive, and radiated a sense of wisdom and compassion that drew people to her. At the age of 48, as Corey witnessed the unfolding tragedy in her beloved Holland under the grip of the National Socialist regime, She could not remain a passive observer. The relentless persecution of Jews and the unspeakable suffering all around compelled her to take action. In her heart, she knew that something had to be done, and she was determined to be the one to do it. With unwavering resolve, she conceived a daring plan to provide aid and shelter to those in peril, particularly the persecuted Jewish community. What makes this story even more remarkable is that her idea was met with immediate approval, not only from her own heart, but from the hearts of her father and brother as well. Casper and Willem got building the hiding place. The hiding place in the Ten Boom family home was a carefully constructed secret compartment designed to conceal Jews, members of the Dutch underground, and other refugees from the Nazi authorities during World War II. This ingenious hiding place played a crucial role in saving many lives. The hiding place was located in the Ten Boom family home, which was a four-story building in Harlem. It was situated above the family's watch shop on the ground floor. The hiding place was cleverly concealed behind a false wall on the top floor of the house. The entrance to the hiding place was hidden behind a wardrobe in Cory Ten Boom's bedroom. To access it, one had to pull a lever, which released a latch and allowed the false wall to swing open like a door. The hiding place was a small, cramped space, measuring approximately six feet in length, six feet in height, and three feet in width. It was just large enough to accommodate a few people at a time. It was constructed using wooden beams, panels, and walls. It was designed to be as inconspicuous as possible blending in with the rest of the room when the false wall was closed. The walls were covered with a layer of wallpaper to further disguise its presence. Inside the hiding place, there were a few basic necessities, including a small table, a couple of chairs, and a makeshift toilet. These items were essential to provide some comfort and sustenance to those in hiding. The construction included a ventilation system to ensure a supply of fresh air, A small air vent was discreetly placed to allow for air circulation. Lighting was provided by a small electric light bulb. The Ten Boom family went to great lengths to keep the existence of the hiding place a secret. They took precautions to ensure that the false wall and entrance were not easily detectable. The wardrobe that concealed the entrance was designed to look like any other piece of furniture in the room. To warn those in hiding of potential danger, a buzzer system was installed. If someone approached the upper floor of the hiding place, the buzzer would be activated, 
giving those inside a signal to remain silent and hidden. The design of the hiding place allowed for relatively quick and easy access. When the danger had passed, the false wall could be closed again, concealing the entrance and returning the room to its ordinary appearance. In this sanctuary, Corey found room for about six or seven souls at a time, sheltering them from the storm of persecution. The occupants were a diverse mix of humanity, Jewish individuals, Dutch resistance fighters, intellectually disabled, and others deemed unfit by the Nazi regime. Sometimes these courageous souls stayed for just a fleeting few hours, using Corey's house as a temporary respite on their perilous journey to other safe havens. At other times, the walls of her home became their protective cocoon for months, a place where they could gather their strength before continuing their arduous escape to safer locations. The stakes were high, and every moment counted. At the faintest sound of an alarm, signaled by a small bell strategically placed near the staircase, the refugees had just over a minute to disappear into the clandestine heaven, clutching their meager belongings. There they would remain in absolute silence, their very existence suspended in motionless anticipation until the danger had passed. To the outside world, the watchmaker's shop operated as a perfect cover. Its constant stream of customers and visitors made it an ideal front for these courageous activities, deflecting any suspicion that might arise. Gradually, Corey found herself at the helm of an extraordinary network known as the Beye Group, derived from Beye, B-E-J-E, the shop's business name. Comprising around 80 individuals, their collective mission was to seek out res- refugees and find safe houses among other brave Dutch citizens willing to provide sanctuary, much as Corey herself did. It's estimated that through this clandestine network, Corey Ten Boom played a pivotal role in saving the lives of approximately 800 individuals, along with numerous members of the Dutch resistance, Jewish individuals, and students who faced persecution for their unwavering refusal to collaborate with the Nazis. An unexpected turn of events shattered the fragile peace they had built. It started with an unassuming visit to the Ten Booms family shop. A man, his face etched with desperation, entered their humble establishment and confided in Corey. He revealed that he and his wife were Jewish, and they urgently needed money to bribe a watchful policeman. Without hesitation, Corey assured him that she could provide the necessary funds. Tragically, this man, whose name would forever be associated with betrayal, would go on to deliver a devastating blow. On February 28, 1944, he betrayed the Ten Booms to the ruthless Gestapo, the covert Nazi police force. The Gestapo, armed with this information, moved swiftly. They placed the watchmaker's shop under intense surveillance, patiently awaiting their moment. Throughout that fateful day, their agents watched as individuals approached the shop's entrance. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the Gestapo pounced, arresting every person who dared to cross the threshold. By nightfall, around 30 individuals found themselves cruelly detained, victims of treachery in a world besieged by darkness. In a swift and chilling operation, the Gestapo descended upon the Ten Boom residents. Their targets were Corey, her father Casper, and her siblings, including Willem, Nolly, and Betsy, as well as her nephew Peter. One by one, they were apprehended and taken into custody, their lives abruptly upended. The Gestapo, fueled by suspicion, conducted a thorough search of the entire house. Their meticulous examination left no stone unturned, as they scoured every nook and cranny. Yet despite their relentless efforts, the secret refuge where four Jews, two men and two women, and two brave resistance fighters sought shelter remained concealed in the hiding place. It was a testament to the extraordinary determination of everyone involved. With the house still under constant surveillance, the fugitives remained hidden for a grueling 47 hours. In the stifling silence of their cramped hiding place, they clung to hope with unwavering resolve, enduring hunger and thirst. Their salvation came at the hands of Corey's resourceful network, who swooped in to rescue them. 
Meanwhile, in the darkest hours of their detention, Caspar Ten Boom received a chilling ultimatum. He could face the death penalty for his heroic efforts to save Jews. Without hesitation, his response echoed with unwavering resolve. Quote, it would be an honor to give my life for God's chosen people. Unquote. And indeed, his words carried the weight of profound sacrifice. For just ten days after his arrest, at the age of 84, Caspar Ten Boom breathed his last breath, a testament to his unwavering devotion. Corey and her sister Betsy, after enduring imprisonment in three different prisons over the course of ten agonizing months, found themselves bound for Ravensbrück, the ominous concentration camp located near Berlin, Germany. In a cruel twist of fate, Betsy, at the age of 59, succumbed to the brutal conditions she endured, unable to overcome the relentless hardships thrust upon her. Meanwhile, their brother Willem, aged 60, had faced imprisonment for his cooperation with the resistance. In the confines of his cell, he fell ill, battling tuberculosis. Tragically, he would not live to see the dawn of freedom, passing away shortly after the war's end. Among the Ten Boom family, their nephew Christian, a mere 24 years old at the time, faced an even more harrowing fate. Accused of involvement in the resistance movement, he was transported to the infamous Bergen-Belsen death camp. An ominous veil of silence enveloped his fate, and his whereabouts remain a haunting mystery to this day. But Corey returned. In the twilight of 1944, almost miraculously, her name found its way onto a list of those slated for release. Corey believed it was due to a clerical error, because shortly after her release, all the women her age were put to death. Back in her homeland of Holland, she began to mend the physical and emotional scars inflicted during the time of captivity. Nestled in the comforting embrace of her Harlem home, she braved the bitter winter months that marked the waning days of the war. However, her spirit remained far from dormant, as she herself would declare, quote, God gave us love to enable us to pardon our enemies, unquote. Corey was a paragon of forgiveness. She not only pardoned the loss of her loved ones and the unfathomable suffering she endured in the concentration camp, but she ventured even further, while delivering a speech in 1947 in the heart of Munich, a man approached her, extending a hand in greeting. At the sight of his face, she recognized him immediately, the face of one of the most brutal guards from Ravensbrück, the very camp where she and her sister Betsy had been subjected to inhumane conditions. This particular guard went out of his way to treat Betsy with every form of inhumanity. How could she possibly shake this man's hand? Here is Corey describing how she was able to forgive this man. It was some time ago that I was in Berlin. And there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Bohm, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw... That man, that was one of the most cruel officers, guards, in the concentrate, in concentration camp. And that man said, I have, I'm now a Christian, I have found the Lord Jesus, I read my Bible and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world, also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done, but then I have asked God grace for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And Fräulein Tambom wants him here forgiven. Will you forgive me? And I could not. When I was in a concentration camp, one of the most terrible things I had to go through was that they stripped us of all our clothing. And we had to stand naked. 
The first time was the worst. I said, Betsy, I cannot bear this. And suddenly it was as if I saw Jesus at the cross. And the Bible tells, they took his garments, he hanged there naked. And I knew he hanged there for me, for my sins. And by my suffering, I understood a fraction of the suffering of Jesus Christ. And it made me so thankful that I could bear my suffering. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But when I saw, when I experienced that I could not forgive, suddenly I knew I myself have no forgiveness. Do you know that Jesus has said that? When you do not forgive those who have sinned against you, my heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. I, I knew, oh, I'm not ready for Jesus' coming because I have no forgiveness for my sins. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I took one of these beautiful texts, one of these boundless resources, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment, I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. After she forgave this man, driven by an unshakable belief that her life was a divine gift, Corey established a convalescent home in Blaumendal, a sanctuary for survivors seeking healing and respite. She was driven by the profound lessons she and her sister Betsy had gleaned from the depths of the concentration camp. Quote, there is no pain so deep that God's love cannot reach. End quote. At the age of 53, Corey embarked on a global ministry to share her faith and experiences, spanning over 60 countries in the next 33 years of her life. In 1968, the Jerusalem Museum of the Holocaust honored her by asking her to plant a tree in memory of the countless Jewish lives she and her sister had saved, a tree that continues to flourish today. A film based on her extraordinary life was made in 1975. As previously mentioned, Corey was a woman of deep faith. In 1978, she suffered a debilitating stroke that left her paralyzed, but her indomitable spirit persisted. She passed away on April 15, 1983, her 91st birthday, a date of significance in Jewish tradition reserved for those uniquely blessed by God, a fitting testament to the remarkable life and legacy of Corey Ten Boom. In 1987, the Corey Ten Boom Foundation took a pivotal step, acquiring the very house where Corey had once lived. The following year, they swung open its doors to the public, transforming it into a living museum, a sacred site of historical significance, and a boundless wellspring of inspiration for the faithful. As you step inside, the museum transports you through time, revealing the rooms of the Ten Boom household as they once were, adorned with their cherished furniture, personal possessions, and family portraits. The very refuge where lives were saved stands as a testament to their incredible courage. Here, you'll also find a permanent exhibit commemorating the Dutch resistance movement, a stirring tribute to those who fought against the darkness of tyranny. In a beautiful twist of fate, the Ten Boom home has once again become an open-door house, 
mirroring the family's original vision, guided by their unwavering principles and faith. Remarkably, admission is free, ensuring that the legacy of open-hearted hospitality continues to thrive. And downstairs on the ground floor, the watchmaker's shop still hums with activity, preserving the living history of the Ten Boom family. The story of Corey Ten Boom is not merely a chapter in history, but a testament to the extraordinary achievements of an ordinary woman. Even today, her incredible deeds serve as a beacon, rousing us from the slumber of denial and indifference that can often shroud our hearts when faced with the trials of the world. Her life reminds us that one person's unwavering commitment to goodness can ignite a spark of hope capable of illuminating even the darkest corners of our existence. Thank you for listening to this Hero Heart story. If you would like to learn more about the Ten Boom family, I highly recommend the following books. The first one is The Hiding Place, which is authored by Corey Ten Boom herself. There's nothing like reading a book of a first-hand account from someone who personally experienced this time in history. Another book is The Watchmaker's Daughter, The True Story of World War II, heroine Corey Ten Boom. This book is authored by Larry Loftus. And then there's a lovely children's book called Corey Ten Boom, The Courageous Woman and the Secret Room, authored by Laura Caputo Wickham. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Coffee Corner. If you would like to contribute something to the conversation, please send it to Mindset Matters Podcast, numeral one at gmail.com. Com. Up in the subject line, if you would please write Coffee Corner, that would help me sort emails. And please let me know if you would like your full name read on the podcast, or if you would rather your contribution be anonymous. You can write to me about anything, your thoughts on a previous episode, things currently happening in your life, any sort of reflections, um, so we can have a dialogue of sorts. Um, since this is the first episode, I'll share a little bit about me. Um, I am the mom of three kids. They're adults now. I have been a lifelong educator, started out with teaching and then being a Title I reading interventionist. And then I was a principal for a while, um, very much enjoyed my job. Uh, but I have an adult daughter with disabilities. She is almost 32. And uh, I am now her, what they call PCP, primary care provider. So I've had kind of a big switch um, from a very busy career, juggling a lot of balls and um, making a lot of decisions and things um, to more of a caretaking role. And it's been a big adjustment for me. And but I'm very happy to be able to do it. Um, and the reason why I started the podcast is because um, really since the pandemic and all kinds of other things going on, the world has gotten really dark <laughs> and um it can't help but make you depressed if that's all you listen to, focus on, think about. And um, I think I was becoming, you know, caught up in a little sense of hopelessness and depression and just thinking, you know, what what is happening in the world and like, what is what is everything coming to um, and where are we headed? Um, so I really have taken a concerted effort to work on my mind and focus on the positive things. Um, not a toxic positivity as the younger people say, but, um, just as a way of keeping my, my heart and mind healthy, just like you keep your body healthy, you know, you have to put in things that are good for you. Um, so that's a little bit about myself and why I wanted to start the podcast is to just kind of put some good out into the world and help us all to refocus our mindset a little bit. Um, because there are amazing people and good people and good things happening. Um, so another thing about me, <laughs> I have a deep affection for coffee of all kinds. I don't discriminate. I just really like coffee. Um, so I'll tell you about the kind I'm drinking today. 
I was in the grocery store the other day and I saw honeydew and I got a little nostalgic because I used to live in Rhode Island and they had honeydew stores down there and I would occasionally get coffee there. And But when I moved, we don't seem to have them around here. And so when I saw it in the grocery store, I picked it up and I have the flavor Crazy Caramel. um, And it's really quite good. So (laughs) that's the coffee I have for today. Um, It's a beautiful day in New England. I live in New England. It is just a wonderful, beautiful time of year. Fall is just gorgeous here. Um, If you've never been to New England, it's worth the trip in fall just to see, you know, the beautiful, beautiful foliage, um, and, and just to enjoy nature. Um, I want to know what you think about that first episode. As I was researching for the episode, I really, you know, it's just mind blowing to me what people went through during World War II. I think, you know, there's enough distance now that we maybe have forgotten what those people went through. Um, and it was, it was worldwide. I don't think there was any part of the world that wasn't affected in some way. Um, and just how horrific it was, but also how, how heroic it was. So just a complete dichotomy of, you know, what we each have in us. We have the, the power to be a hero and we also have the power to be just terrible. And I think we all make those choices every single day. Um, but I was thinking about Corey Ten Boom and her family. And I was wondering, you know, could I be that brave? Could I stand up to um, something, you know, as insidious as the Gestapo and what was happening at that time? And I just don't know if I would be that brave. I, I was trying to think of the closest thing I could connect to. And I guess it would have to be, um, you know, the recent pandemic. And um, I mean, I was a little afraid of the the mask police, never mind the Gestapo. (laughs) Um, So, you know, you can just see how when things are polarizing and lines are drawn, um, you know, would you have the courage to stand for what is right? And when I reflected on myself, um, I would like to think that I would. um, But I guess you don't know until you're there. Um, And those were some of my thoughts as I was researching that first episode. Before I leave us, I want to leave us with a gratitude quote of the day. Um, This comes from Will Arnett. And his quote is, I am happy because I'm grateful. I choose to be grateful. That gratitude allows me to be happy, unquote. And what I like about this quote so much is the word choose, um, Because happiness, I have found, is not a feeling that just sort of happens to you because, you know, your circumstances are great and um, the weather's great and I feel happy. Um, It's a choice. And um, it's a choice every single day, you know, when you put your feet on the floor to be grateful. Um, And sometimes I'll, I'll even start with my feet. Like, you know, I'm so thankful for my feet. Oh, speaking of, I just, I went for a hike yesterday and I'm not a hiker by any stretch, but I'm trying to walk more. And it was about a three mile hike. And so my, my feet are hurting today. I don't know if you want to know that, but anyway. Um, so I really like this quote and that it's a practical way to choose happiness by choosing to be grateful. Um, and it really does turn your mind and which turns your heart right towards happiness. So thank you so much for joining me for episode one. Um, We have episode two coming up that will be on Ernest Shackleton. And then episode three is going to be really cute. Um, It's going to be a hero animal. So I'm anxious to, to share that one with you all as well. If you have a hero heart story um, about yourself or someone, you know, in your corner of the world, please send that along to Mindset Matters Podcast, number one, at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for giving your time to listen to this episode of Mindset Matters, The Courage to Continue. You are of value. You are loved. You are not alone. If you are struggling with thoughts of suicide, help is available. Dial 988 24 hours a day for free confidential support. If you are not in crisis but need support, please feel free to reach out to me at the email mindsetmatterspodcast 
numeral one at gmail.com. Again, that's all lowercase mindset matters podcast, the numeral one at gmail.com. Remember to change your day by what you think and say. We'll see you next time.